my name's Happy Pants. That's uh, my trail name. I got on day six in Maine in the Hundred Mile Wilderness. We can't talk about smoking weed. No, we totally can. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> that has a lot to do with it. <laughs> it's legal in Maine, my, right? It's legal in Maine. There you go. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, I'm hiking down the trail. Um, I show up to the shelter. And I stay with this group of northbounders. Uh, they're called Nobos, and I'm a Sobo, southbounder. And they don't really, there's some weird rivalry between the northbounders and si the southbounders. And uh, I didn't know that until <laughs> once I met these guys, they kind of threw me under the bus. Um, just weren't very friendly, and then like in the morning I shared my coffee with one of them, and he was like, oh, you know, since you shared your coffee, I'll tell you about all the Sobo traps I set up. And I was like, oh man, Sobo traps. In my head, like, oh, what an asshole. <laughs> like, this trip's are not already hard enough. You have to, like, make it harder on others. Potentially injure somebody. And one of the other Northbounders heard that he had set up a Nobo trap and he was describing it as a ladder. And she came in and was like, yeah, a Northbounder tried using that and actually did get hurt. And it's really messed up. So, after I heard that, I made it my mission to try to put an end to this Nobo Sobo rivalry. Um, <clears throat> but they also told me that if I wanted to do a big day, that day would be the best day to do it. And it's 21 or 23 miles past like two shelters. And so I was like all amped that I could do my first big day. And I was just so new at it, but so excited. And so that day started at like 5 in the morning and I was just boom cranking it out all day. And uh, I like wobbled into the final like uh, the shelter that I was staying in. But I had just before then talked to this lady named Webwalker. And she was like yay when she ran into me because she was also heading southbound. And like I started late September 29th on Katahdin. So for her to run into somebody going southbound on her section hike is huge because there's like nobody else out there. Um, she hiked in 2012. Her name's Web Walker. You said Web Walker? Web Walker, meaning like she got up the first and headed out on the trail first every day. God bless her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was the whole hike that I did, like big miles. I was chafing in between my butt cheeks, like, so bad, just, and I was just like, I'll get through this, and like, I, there's no pain I can't take, you know, it was so bad, and I was worried, because I wear compression shorts to, like, prevent chafing in between my junk or my thighs, so I was worried that that was, um, uh, gonna interfere with my entire trek, so I get to the shelter, and she shows up, and I'm, like, doing the hiker wobble to get my water. And I tell her about my chafing problem, <clears throat> which was great, because it started our conversation just right. And just, like, sparked up a bowl with her. She's in her late, like, early, I would say mid-40s. And she's from Florida. She was like, do you have a trail name? I was like, no, I'm just Eddie for now. And she was like, oh, okay. And then uh, we were just passing a joint around that I had brought. And somehow, oh, I started talking about my friend Gabby wanting to die at the age of 50 because she doesn't want to experience any of the old age because she thinks that it's all, like, traumatic. Because she's had a traumatic grandmother experience. And so she just wants to die young. And how it affects me, and I like started going into this like conversation is kind of down. And Web Walker goes, uh, "Let's change the subject, Happy Pants." And I was like, "You know, I don't have a trail name." And I was like super eager, and it felt like it just suited me and fit just right. So after having a really long day, uh, it felt really good to like come away with a trail name and to meet this awesome lady who's never given anybody a trail name before and was like super pleased and we've been best friends ever since. She and I hang out pretty <clears throat> Not pretty often, uh, but we talk pretty often. So that's how I got my trail name. It's a long, weird, 
story that came out that I have a, you know, a purpose on the trail to put an end to this rivalry. And I did, man. I Well, I didn't put an end to it, but I tried my damnedest. Every northbounder, so all the northbounders that I passed in Maine, they were all, like, defeated and ready to, like, just finish the trail. And they were just, like, the worst mood. Also, like, they don't want to talk to some nor some sobo and try to, like, be cheery. Who's because fresh they're just not and... a good... Yeah. yeah. And I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. They threw me a few pointers here and there. But uh, the way that I saw them just kind of, like, pass me by and not want to talk to me or, like, throw me under the bus... Like, they were like, oh, yeah, go t check out the Gulf Haggis Trail. It's totally worth it. It's an extra five miles off. It's an extra five miles off trail. And you're only skipping, like, point two of the trail, so don't, like, stress. And it's so worth it. But when I got there and I did the five miles, there was, like, no waterfalls at all to be seen because we were in a drought. So they just threw me under the bus like that. Ah, it hurt, man. Hurt way down. But I needed that to, like, talk to all of the northbounders that I ran into at the beginning of their hike down in Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina. I started, like, every single one of them I'd stop and talk to and inform them about the rivalry and how I'm trying to put an end to it and also just really get to know each one of them. And uh, I've made a lot of friends. I've run into over 50 of these hikers that I ran into in the beginning again later on the trail up north as I would just go up there and hang out and do some day hikes or trail magic. So it's really cool re-running into these people. And I also heard that 2017, like the class of 2017, has been like the most well-behaved and like not a, a wild rowdy crowd this year. So I'm not going to say take I don't, credit for I'm that? not going to say I take credit yeah. for it. I mean, people throw the word hero around. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't necessarily hear too much about the rivalry between the Novos and Sobos this year. Oftentimes, I've heard <laughs> from other hikers that Northbounders are very. Um, they feel prestigious, or like like they're above other people. They stroll into town with their their crew, and then they don't talk to any of the locals. They kind of come to hostels and stuff and just do, get their business done and stay within their little group and don't like actually talk to people, which makes it seem very off-putting. And uh, they feel entitled almost to like the trail and to like hostels that they come through and stuff. You know, this whole thing's a privilege to be able to come out here and do this. You're not, you don't own the trail. Nobody owns the trail. You know, you're not any better than anybody else just because you chose to give up a bunch of stuff and come out here and hike the trail. Nobody, it doesn't make you any better. So, um, I didn't see a lot of that this year, but I saw a lot of that last year when I started. Yeah. Well, on a more positive note, can you tell me um, about trail magic? Have you had any particularly memorable trail magic happen to you? Mm -hmm. Like I said, I started super late and hiked through the winter. So, trail magic normally consists of some kind of like, well, the most common, I would say, for the northbounders are like roadside trail magic. There's somebody just sets up like a, a grill or a table with a bunch of food and just whatever hikers come through, they get it. I've done it. I've gone to Upper Goose Pond in Massachusetts, did some trail magic there, brought like 34 ears of corn and two handles of alcohol, a bunch of burgers, and then venison, uh, not venison, whatever is deer. What's yeah, that's venison. Venison, yeah. yeah, and tuna steak for all the hikers, you know? So that's trail magic. It's just like random acts of kindness to people that are on their long distance pilgrimage and just trying to be there in support of somebody trying to accomplish a goal. Um, it's it's not that the hiker would never make it without your support, but it's just, you know, it's nice to have cheerleaders. Absolutely. It's like the people so. uh, that stand on the roadside for marathons and hand the little cups of water mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that type of trail magic I didn't get um, very much of, really almost at all. Because, like, a lot of the hostels were closed. A lot of the places that I wanted to go to, or clothes. 
the ice cream challenge, everything was closed for me, which I really didn't bother me any. Um, it just meant like my trail magic was like one day at Upper Goose Pond, I woke up with four inches of snow on the ground. And I snowed all day, so I ended up at the end of the day, 22 inches of snow that I was post holing through at the end of a five day stretch. So I had no electricity in my phone. Like I was down to 6%. I had a backup like satellite communicator, very low on battery. Um, out of the, I was out of food, like I said, water was kind of hard to get to because of the snow. So the snow comes in sideways. So it sticks to all the trees and the blazes are white. So you just like eliminates any blaze. And with that much snow, you can't see a path. And also, it sticks to all these limp, like, very limp, limp, I guess is the right word, branches and small stuff. And just falls, falls, and you can't see the path at all. So, what was I going to say? Yeah, so, it was a really, really tough day. And I did 14 miles. Uh, and I was just defeated because I was getting lost. My headlamp wouldn't work after it gets below 30 degrees. So I was, and like, sun goes down at 4.30. So I was having a really tough time. The next day I got off trail. It took me five hours to get three miles. And uh, got off trail and called my trail boss. And was like, I don't know if I can do this trail if it's going to be this hard every day. It is obnoxious, you know? And... She was like, well, why don't you, you were saying something about in Rutland, Vermont, there is a concert your friend was going to go to, uh, Dark Star Orchestra. Maybe that'll lift your spirits up. And I was like, all right, you know, I am going to do that. But to do that, I had to get a half an hour drive or half an hour hitch to another town that has an enterprise and then rent a car, drive two hours back to Rutland and then come back in the morning and then hitch again and get back on trail. So I did. And so the best part of this was the trail magic that the hitch was. You know, I got a hitch from this lady. Conversation sparked up right away. It was fluid and organic. And she was telling me she has a farm and uh, how she has people come and do work for stay all the time. And I was like, wow, that's really great. My, my lady friend and I plan on meeting up and need a place to stay in about you know, four days or five days. Maybe we can stay with you. And she's like, that's great, yeah. So we exchange numbers. We get to Enterprise. She's like, I'm going to come in with you just to make sure things move smoothly, which they didn't. I never have a smooth interaction in any Enterprise or rental car place. So I'm glad she was there because we get there, and it has to be done on your credit card. And so I only had like $200 available on my credit card, so it couldn't work. And uh, so I was kind of like struggling with the idea, and then her, she just came up and was like, "I'll I'll pay for it." And I had cash. I gave her one hundred and fifty dollars in cash, but it was like the insurance cost was in her name, the whole car was in her name, uh, and she was putting the down payment and all the costs together. And I was like, "Wow, you know." And I paid her in cash for all, everything. Um, except for I was like a hundred dollars short because of the like once I return it then there's that like reversion of a hundred dollars so I think I gave her like an extra two hundred dollars and I was like I will see you this upcoming weekend thank you so much and I'll get that two hundred dollars back from you then but this is just an insurance like thank you for trusting me after I'm a total stranger to you really so that, that was some trail magic because I was able to get up to Rutland Stay at the Yellow Deli and partied my booty off at the venue. Had a great time at the bar afterwards with some How was the band? people. The band was phenomenal. What was and the name of the band? The name of the band is uh, Dark Star Orchestra. It's mostly a uh, dead head cover. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so where, was was, where was this lady's farm at? In Massachusetts. You mentioned your Solid Rock Farms. Okay. That's her, uh, her farm. All right, I'll check that out. Um, you mentioned your trail boss. What, yeah. What's a trail boss? So a trail boss is somebody that you kind of deem the most helpful to you from home. So my ex-girlfriend was my trail boss. 
Meaning, like, if I needed to ship something home or have something shipped to me on the trail, I contact her and say, hey, like, uh, you know, I need some more cash or I need more of this or this and I'll be at this location by this point. What do you think you can maybe mail something out to me? So they're like your support person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trail boss kind of monitored where I was at all times and kind of like kept an eye on me. Somebody like would notice if you went missing. Yeah, and and also, you know, just like kept everybody else at home informed. So I didn't have to reach out to everybody always. Right on. Yeah, so that worked out really well. And I usually ask um, a, a, about people's uh, essential like, or favorite piece of gear. As, as someone who's done some winter hiking, can you can you give some gear recommendations for winter hikers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It all depends on what type of winter hiking. The Appalachian Trail, really, you just get snow, except for north of New Hampshire, or north of Vermont. North of Vermont, you have, like, Rhine ice, and it's, it gets, it's more solid, so you need micro spikes for that, if not crampons. But my favorite gear is really, like, my down booties. You have a solid bottom. Not solid, but, like, well enough you can walk around on them. Like, pillows or, like, sleeping bags per foot. Um, my other favorite gear, I really like my Lone Peaks. They're the Ultras, Trail Runner, Lone Peak um, shoes. They're pretty good, the 3.0s. Gear. My, my pack, okay. I liked my pack a lot. I got the uh, Granite Gear Virgo 2 which is like the extended version of the Virgo one. And it has the roll, it's just a solid stuff sack practically. Uh, no back padding, no hip padding, very little shoulder padding. Um, super basic, not waterproof, and only weighs like a pound and two ounces, 18 ounces. That worked out really well because it's super, super durable. I throw the thing all around all the time and I fall all the time. And, uh... Well, if you fall all the time, um, <laughs> have you had any, any injuries? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing that... Things that could have very easily taken me off trail if it was like a centimeter off. So, and I was going over Kinsman in the whites and I slightly underestimated how how tough it was going to be. I was wearing my spikes and everything. And I just was exhausted getting up there. So I made a half attempt to step and like got on this rock that was super slippery and it just like slipped out from under me. And I fell forward onto this jagged rock that came out of the ground and hit me right here. You know, if it was like a centimeter higher, I would have lost all my bottom rail and would have had to go get new teeth. I don't have dental insurance. I don't have health insurance. It would have t ruined me, you know? Yeah, it definitely would have ended your hike. Yeah, so I, I ended up with just like a, a little scar right below my teeth. And then um, hiking through the whites a few days before that, uh, I was post-holing through like... 18 inches of snow going around Jefferson and up to Washington and uh, you can't see the trail but you're making these like just big steps and then sometimes there's like a gap between these rocks and these rocks are pretty jagged so you have like some solid momentum going forward and you step in and your foot gets caught into these rocks and you're moving forward your shin hits that rock and then just like bows backwards the whole area just like I have scars on both knees from that that sounds horrible the it whites was, sound like a really dangerous place the whites are really uh, the whites and the southern 100 miles of Maine are the hardest parts of the trail yeah you've done like they say like you've hiked the whole trail all the way up to New Hampshire that's about 80 percent of the trail but you really have only done 20% of the difficulty. And it's all warm up if you're northbound. You get some main and you're just like, wow, oh, 
well, or like New Hampshire, just like w this is real climbing because for the most part, you're touching in front of you what you're climbing. They call it a, a 4.4 climb or something like that, where it's like, or maybe it's a 3, or I forget how they term it, but um, they you, well, you have to have levels. contact yeah. with. Yeah, one is like just regular stroll, two is like pretty intense, three is like you can touch in front of you, four, you have like throw in snow and rock scrambles and some rock climbing and stuff like that. Do you have, I'm not, not everybody's been able to answer this question, but why, why, did, why did you do this? Um... It's okay if you can't. Not everybody can articulate their reason. No, I can. It's just do I want to get into the personal ah. of it. Uh, one of the biggest reasons was to grow up and become the man that I think that I could be. The man that I thought I wanted to become. And ready to, for fatherhood, all that jazz. Like, be an adult. Like, go do this and learn how to be an adult. Like, a real man. And uh, how little did I know that it would like take a total different turn. Like I, so yeah. So some things happened to me where I was like, well, I need to cut, like, take this off of my bucket list first and grow from it and like really have a spiritual journey so that I'm ready for you know settling down. And, it's like a rite of passage. Right. It was also like a pilgrimage for me, a large, um, like, anybody can hike the AT. I believe that. Anybody can. But not everybody can hike it in the, in the winter. And I saw that as, like, a really great opportunity to really test my body and test, do things that not everybody's done. Yeah. You know? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. So, this hiker has a horrible, huge blister on his heel. It looks mm -hmm. really wretched. Um, and you were helping him out, talking to him about his boots and what he needs to do about that. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that so maybe some beginner hikers can get some advice on that? So he just bought his boots three days ago, the day he started his trail. First thing is you want to break in boots prior to doing long distance. Secondly, you don't need boots out here. I hiked with a pair of boots for about 230 miles and I ended up with like swamp foot um, and a lot of a lot of problems. I had a high, good ankle support which is you know what they always tell you to get when you're shopping for boots and they were waterproof just like what any any hiker would think to get right mm -hmm. that's not a long distance trekker and super sure. wise about the trail. Sounds right to me. Right, it does seem right, yeah. And REI people will tell you the same thing. Sure. So, what I told him was that he needs to ditch his boots They're early enough where he can return them for full value and get a pair of trail runners. And he has wide feet just like I do. Best trail runners for wide feet are ultras. Ultras have this super thick toe box. And, uh, it's almost like wearing pillows all around your foot. It's really nice. I've worn, once I switched out of my boots, I got that same piece, or a uh, same shoe in Massachusetts, and I went all the way down to Hot Springs, Virginia, with it. Hot Springs, Tennessee, wherever Hot Springs is. That's 1,300 miles. And I didn't have foot problems. I didn't get a single blister. I also recommended to him, he just had like, some really thick some, um, Marina Wool REI brand socks, really thick ones, which I think had a lot to do with the blister as well, because you don't need thick socks to prevent blisters. You don't need thick socks in this temperature. You need to let your feet breathe, and they're going to stay warm regardless when you're moving and hiking. The only time you need to throw a sock, thick socks on are when it's like super cold out or you're trying to sleep. And really, in a sleeping bag, you don't want to isolate your things. You want to sleep naked in your sleeping bag. Okay, not that I always did. So, 
with his boots and told him to ditch him and get some lemon peaks. So he's got them. He's ordering them now. And I told him to get some darn tough or smart wool or point six socks because they have a lifetime guarantee. Anytime they get a hole, uh, they stretch thin or they just don't fit right or you're unsatisfied even, they have a hundred percent uh, swap out guarantee where you just walk into the store with your pair that you're unsatisfied with, put them in a bin, let somebody know, and then you take another one off the shelf. I'm not sure exactly if you go to the register, every store is different, but sometimes they just swap them. Um, that makes it so easy. They're expensive, yeah. Some Like this pair here, they're not returnable. But I have other pairs. They're just ankle socks. They're like $16 a pair. But I will never have to buy another pair again because I have them for life as long as I can keep them together and know where they are so you also told them to buy a size larger yeah so I didn't believe it either when I first started hiking I'd read it seems like, like it would rub if you bought a size too big you think that yeah you would have a lot of weight like moving room causing a lot of friction mm -hmm. so I read a lot of books before starting my hike and they all said like to buy a bigger size and I was like, you know what, I still have these hiking shoes that I wear on the daily. I'll just wear these until they be go bad and I'll throw on my boots. And I wish I had... Well, I'm glad I went through that experience. It was traumatic. I My feet swelled up so bad that underneath of my toes started blistering because they were just jammed in there. My foot swelled up a whole size and went out also it got wider and that's common that happens to everybody everybody because you have you're putting so much weight and constant shock on your feet with the extra weight on your back and these hard the hard terrain so much damage to your feet so and the most like the best you can take care of them or the better you take care of them the better you're going to enjoy your hike your feet are your only means of transportation that's kind of the point. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I started with size too small. I had to cut the toe box out, so my feet were sticking out past my shoes, and uh, hiked out of the hundred mile wilderness like that. That's crazy. Wow. Um. And it's been six months, and I still haven't shrunk back. All right. So I always ask people this, do uh, you have any interesting bear encounters? I didn't the whole way. You didn't meet nary a bear? I think my biggest problem was in the beginning I hiked with trekking poles. I was just very about getting miles done. Mm -hmm. And I sang a lot and I listened to music a lot without headphones. So it was just like noise. I was always mm -hmm. making noise. And I, I've been recommended multiple times to Get rid of all the noise making, including the uh, trekking poles, singing, you know, just be quiet out there. Um, and then also get rid of your shoes. If you're out there and you're walking barefoot, you're softer, you're not as loud, you know where the twigs are and stuff. And so and the, the biggest reason why you don't see them is because they see you first and they get out of there. So if you don't want to see bears, just sing. Just sing or continue being loud. Yeah, stomp through the forest like crazy humans. All right, right on. Well, um, that about wraps up my questions. Do you have uh, any favorite stories you wanted to tell? I don't think so. All right. You know, I mean, I've had tons and tons of stories, but I like what we got going on so far. I like it too. I think this yeah. has been a good interview. All right, cool. Well, I appreciate you taking the the time to have a little chat with me here while you're while you're at the rest for your your homecoming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice coming down, I'm doing work on the other side of the country, and just decided to come down for the weekend, and drop off that RV. Right on. I'm trying to figure out a way home. <laughs> I know that you will find one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a bunch. Happy pants out. <laughs>